top business stories live from the Sky News City Studio. Serco is told to stop using biometric technology to monitor its workers. Shares of Standard Chartered surge on strong results. Chief Executive Bill Winters tells me the lender still needs to catch up with competitors. And rocking all the way to Oxford Street, Gibson opens its first showcase guitar store outside the United States in London. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The outsourcing company Serco has been told to stop using facial recognition technology and fingerprint scanning to monitor the attendance of its employees. The Information Commissioner found that Serco's leisure trusts had been unlawfully processing the biometric data of more than 2,000 employees at 38 leisure facilities. The Commissioner says Serco failed to show why it used these techniques when less intrusive means such as ID cards or FOBs were available. Well, joining me now is the UK's Information Commissioner, John Edwards. Uh, John, Ed, thank, Ed, thank you to you for joining me. How did you become aware of this? Hi, Ian. It uh, came onto our radar before the pandemic. Somebody drew it to our attention uh, by way of a complaint. Uh, somebody uh, on staff also noticed. Uh, so we started making inquiries then. Um, we've decided to issue this formal notice today because over the last uh, few years, Serco has persisted with the technology um, and with the, uh, the, this kind of technology becoming more and more popular, we thought it was really important to sort of draw some lines in the sand and make it clear that there are ground rules. So we've issued this notice to coincide with uh, the publication of guidance about how to safely and legally use uh, biometric data. As you say, you, you found out about this before the pandemic. Why has it taken so long to issue an enforcement notice? Well, we did have to stop things uh, during the pandemic as we prioritised um, health uh, applications. I wasn't actually here at that time. It's taken longer than I would have liked, longer than I would expect. Um, but, you know, there are duties to collect full information and duties of fairness which require that we give people a decent amount of time to respond to preliminary findings and the like. We've got to the end of that process now and we've taken decisive action. And Serco says that they introduced this technology to make it easier for employees to clock on and off and that it was actually well received by employees. Yeah, the thing is that um, this kind of data is especially sensitive. Um, you know, if you lose an ID card or a fob, you can get it replaced. You can't replace your face uh, or your thumbprint. Uh, so the law has special rules for the use of this kind of data. And it says that even if you do have a legitimate reason to use it, uh, you've got to have freely given consent or it's got to be absolutely necessary. Now, for freely given consent, there's got to be readily available alternatives. We found that Serco did not offer their employees uh, meaningful alternatives. It was by, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, mandatory. Uh, and there is really uh, a bit of a power imbalance. It's difficult for an employee to say, no, I'm not going to do that, if that's the, 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 the basis on which they're going to get paid. But say for the sake of argument, John, if I was malingering, I could easily just hand over my pass to a colleague to allow them to clock on and off on my behalf. I mean, this is a, a far more accurate way of checking whether someone's actually doing the job they're paid for, isn't it? Well, uh, we did not find that that was the case. We did not find that there was an evidence base to justify a kind of disproportionate use of this very intrusive technology. There may be cases in which it is justified, and that's why this is not a decision against the technology itself. It's about the particular deployment that Serco used. They had an opportunity to explain to us why it was necessary. They weren't able to. Uh, they weren't able to explain why alternatives were not uh, suitable. Uh, and so we've issued this notice and, and made a finding that they are in breach of the UK GDPR. But surely in an age where we've got hundreds of thousands of people swinging the lead and working from home and not doing their jobs properly, employers are surely entitled to use technology to, to, to check up on them at times, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, and, you know, I, I like being able to open my phone with my face. Uh, this is not an anti-technology ruling. This is um, making sure that everybody is aware of the rules of the road uh, and that the technological solutions that are used have to be proportional to the business case 
uh, that you're describing. In this case, it was not. All right, John, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Gibson, the world-famous guitar maker loved by many of the world's top musicians, is opening its first big store outside the United States, just off London's Oxford Street. Opening tomorrow, the Gibson Garage will allow visitors to plug in and play more than 300 electric and acoustic guitars. The launch was attended by, among others, guitar heroes including Jimmy Page, Tony Iommi and Brian May. I've been speaking to Gibson's president and chief executive, Cesar Guaykin, and began by asking him why he chose London for its flagship store. Warning, there's a bit of flash photography coming up. If you think about all the different genres of music that were basically birthed in London, uh, when I think about Jimmy Page, Tony Iommi, Keith Richards, Jeff Beck, even Jimi Hendrix got his name out here, Paul McCartney, Lennon, George Harrison, this has been an ecosystem of music for so many decades that when we were looking at going outside of the US, it was the obvious choice. Yes, you mentioned some of the people you mentioned you had at your launch, uh, Tony Iommi, Jimmy Page, Brian May. I mean, uh, what made uh, them want to come along and join you today? Well, we were thinking about how do we make the greatest impact celebrating the opening. And I think we, uh, we couldn't have had a better trio. Think about Brian with his Red Special and the, the, the cultural moments that he set off with Queen, Tony Iommi defining the heavy metal genre of music with his Gibson SG and uh, and then Jimmy Page, you know, he's the, um, the ultimate ambassador of guitars and Gibson. What's the uh, aim with, uh, with what you're doing here? Is it to sell more produce directly in the store or is this more to sort of showcase the best of Gibson? I think it's a little bit of everything. Well, we really, the way that this starts is by creating this amazing experience place where people can come and, li and watch live music, they can explore guitars, they can play absolutely everything and have a wonderful experience, feel welcome when they walk into the Gibson garage. Everybody here is trained to make everybody feel welcome. So it's really as much as it is being a flagship store, it really is focused on a great experience. And I hope that we can, we can see what's happening in Nashville with the Gibson Garage in Nashville happening in London, but becoming a centre of music and, and part, an integral part of the local music community. Now, you became CEO in, in May last year. What are you trying to do with, with the business? It's, it's really focusing on our core. I think we start and end with our instruments, with our guitars, our artists who are the DNA of Gibson, they choose to play a Gibson because of the quality of the instrument, because of the sound. It, it has an amazing sound, it's a relevant tool for them, and then they fall in love with it. So my focus is focus on the core and then look at what are the other things that we can bring to life to bring great experiences and create engagement, such as you know Gibson TV, Gibson Records, and all these things that happen around the guitar. But building the best guitars we've ever built is our ultimate objective. And you've also indicated that Gibson's going to go back into uh, selling amplifiers. When will those start to uh, go on sale? We launched with the Gibson amplifiers recently, last month in the United States. And as of March, they will be available globally. And that's, you know, it's, it's such a great part of the Gibson DNA. We've been making amplifiers since the 30s. And that in the 60s, around the 60s, we stopped. But a lot of innovation came out of Gibson in sound and so we're going back to that. Now, the business has been owned by private equity consortium led by KKR since 2018. That's normally around the time that uh, a private equity owner would think about uh, selling a business on. Are there any plans for an IPO or anything like that? Yeah, not, not for now. You know, we're, we, uh, we have a great group of shareholders, myself included, and we are, um, I think we have a lot of runway still to go. And yes, at some point, obviously, like you mentioned, Ian, the, the, a private equity firm, natural evolution will be to slide out and have a more, more of a permanent order slide in. But, you know, that's far out in the future. And how much does it cost to open this, uh, this venue? Well, there's a lot of millions of uh, pounds invested in this place. And that's, that's by design. We want to have this be a curated experience. It's not about opening garages all around the world. It's really about each individual place, one at a time, curated experience. Obviously, you've had, you've had a lot, you'll have a lot of people coming in and playing the guitars and uh, playing riffs on it. What, what's your own personal favourite guitar riff? 
my favorite guitar riff. Oh, wow. Are you asking me what, you know, which one of my kids is my favorite? Uh, look, I, I'll tell you this, um, as I was in, in the presence of royalty today, the reason I started playing guitar, the most mo memorable moment, uh, most dramatic moment in my life with regards to music, when, when, I was ten, when I was 10 years old and I heard for the first time the song Black Sabbath on the album Black Sabbath, and that was when I decided I need to learn. Jimmy Page, Tony Iommi and Brian May. What a super group that would have been, eh? Other business news for you now. And shares of Standard Chartered surged by more than 8% at one point today after the FTSE 100 lender reported a full-year pre-tax profit of $5.1 billion for 2023, up 19% on 2022. Stan Chart, which derives the vast majority of its income from Asia, Africa and the Middle East, benefited from an improvement in net interest income. That's the difference between what it pays depositors and charges borrowers, a rise in customer deposits and a reduction in credit impairments. It's raised the full-year dividend by 50% and announced a new $1 billion share buyback. But despite the positive results, Group CEO Bill Winters told me earlier the firm has a long way to go to close the gap on competitors such as HSBC. Yeah, we were at about 0% return six years ago. Uh, we're at 10% today. We wanted, you know, we've been growing, you can do the math, sort of one and a bit percent uh, of, of returns every year. We've done it by, by having much lower uh, loan impairments, loan loss uh, reserves. Uh, which is another way of saying we've been cautious about how we've grown the business back from a, from a pretty tough place to really a pretty good place today. And we're going to keep on going. You know, so I think we've got a long way to go before we can deliver uh, the, what we ultimately think we can deliver. But we're on the right track. Household energy bills are to fall in April following a reduction in the price cap set by the regulator Ofgem. The reduction comes after a fall in wholesale gas prices. Well, Ofgem confirmed that the cap will fall by 12.3%, taking the annual bill for a typical household from £1,928 at present to £1,690, a decline of £238. Well, firstly, this is going to be the lowest amount that people are paying for their energy bills in two years. And £250, uh, almost coming off people's energy bills, is going to be really welcome news for families up and down the country. We still have things like the cost of living uh, payments in place, £900 for people who were really struggling, because we know there are some people who are still having a difficult time. But overall, this is good news for people in the country today. Consumer confidence in the UK fell this month for the first time in four months, according to a closely followed survey published today. The Consumer Confidence Index, published by the data analytics and market research company GFK, fell by two points to minus 21 in February, with four measures down on January and one unchanged. But GFK pointed out that optimism among individuals for their personal financial situation for the next 12 months had not slipped back. It regards that measure as key to understanding the financial mood of the nation because confident householders are more likely to spend. Germany's economy contracted by 0.3% during the final three months of last year, according to the country's statistics office. The main areas of weakness were in investment in the construction sector and investment by businesses in machinery and equipment, which offset a modest rise in both household and government consumption. The statistics office also confirmed that German GDP contracted by 0.3% for the whole of 2023. Just going to take you back to Plymouth now. These are the latest live pictures uh, we have from the uh, southwest city, the uh, Second World War bomb that has been found in the Kiam location of the city is on the move. It is, as we speak, being transported out to sea. We'll have more on that throughout the evening here on Sky News as we get it. In the meantime, still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have finished this Friday afternoon. Don't go away. I'd logged in and it was, uh, I'd seen there was a win. Didn't look at the date, I just looked at it and there was a £2.60 win there. So I said to Debbie, you know, we've won £2.60. She said, great, let's go and have a bacon butty or something, <laughs> you know, celebrate. And, uh, and then later on in the day, another email arrived, exactly the same message. I thought, there's a glitch. And uh, uh, so I logged in again and, and there's a message there saying you've won £61,708,231 and call this number. And, and that's, that's how we found out. And then we had, you know, tried to ring and had problems with the phone signal and so on and so on, you know.
Well, there are three bits of advice that we give them initially. Um, the first one doesn't really apply to Debbie and Richard, and that is uh, maintain your anonymity, uh, at least until you've taken professional advice. The second piece of advice is to, is to really just pause and reflect mm. and put the money in a safe place on deposit. Uh, and the third thing that's really important is to take professional advice from somebody who's suitably qualified um, and in fact, most of the pitfalls seem to emanate from not doing those three things. OK, well, they haven't done the first thing, have they? They've gone public. Why do people go public? I can see the benefits in it, because if somebody's won 61 million, then, then obviously their lifestyle is, is going to visibly change. <laughs> so, you know, there, there is an argument to actually go public and, and manage it um in in a in a in a better way um but the general principle is that i mean there are lots of uh, jackal winners that don't go public you know they maintain their anonymity i mean our typical advice is to you know maintain your anonymity at, le at least until you that initial euphoria has died down and you've had the opportunity to reflect mm. and take professional advice I just took a shower above the clouds. You know why? Because this is the Emirates A380. Sly Emirates, slide better. Well, stocks have opened higher on Wall Street this afternoon and the big story of the week, the chip maker NVIDIA continues to generate headlines. The company's stock market value rose by a record $277 billion yesterday following its forecast busting results on Wednesday night. And today, it saw its market capitalisation rise above $2 trillion for the first time, becoming only the third company to reach this milestone after Apple and Microsoft. Elsewhere on Wall Street, Warner Brothers' discovery is off 12% after it reported a bigger than expected quarterly loss. Well, in Europe, stocks have finished the session in positive territory to largely Ibex in Madrid letting the side down rather. Talking points this afternoon include Lufthansa, which is off 2% in Frankfurt after the unexpected departure of its chief financial officer. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 has also gone into the weekend on a positive note, up a quarter of 1% amid gains for the healthcare and financial sector. No prizes for guessing the leading blue chip gainer today. Yes, Standard Chartered finished up 5.5% uh, in the end. Intercontinental Hotel Group, that's uh, it's another gainer today to mention, up 1.5% after its well-received results earlier this week. Outside the FTSE 100, Hornby has surged by some 33% after Mike Ashley's Fraser's Group took its stake to 
On the foreign exchange markets, the dollar's on course for its first weekly loss this year, sterling up uh, just over a tenth of one percent against the greenback, unchanged more or less against the uh, euro single currency, likewise unchanged against the dollar. Oil price, meanwhile, stumbled on growing signs the Fed is in no rush to cut US interest rates. Barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $82.15 a barrel. That is off just over one and three quarter percent. Well, joining me this afternoon is Myron Jobson. He's the personal finance analyst, of course, at Interactive Investor. Myron, good to see you this afternoon. NVIDIA, everyone's talking about yeah. it. What sort of activity are you seeing on the platform right now? So it seems to be one of the hottest stocks on our platform at the moment. Why? Because it is a play on AI. That's such, been such a prominent theme in recent months, even last year. And so that's climbed up into our, the top 10 most bought stocks on Interactive Investor, and it ranked quite highly. Are clients buying it to hold it or are they buying it to sort of flip it? Well, I say it's more recent. So when I say more recent in recent months, so they're buying because they're seeing opportunities for the future. And we're seeing that that's increased. And there's some suggestion that they are holding it, but maybe not for the long term, but as, as it remains hot and interesting. OK, I mean, I mentioned uh, Apple and Microsoft there, the only other two stocks to hit $2 trillion in, mm. in market capitalisation. NVIDIA's got there more quickly than either of those two. Are those t stocks that are still attracting a lot of interest? Oh, definitely. Remember, they're part of the old fan stocks. You know, they were really hot, weren't they, in the mid and um, 2010s? And that's carried on. And so it's, for investments points of view, these stocks are here to stay. And there's a lot more growth potential, especially as we've come out of this cost of living crisis. Myron, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to cut it short because we've got to go back to Plymouth. I do apologise. Thank you. We are now, as indeed, going back to Plymouth. Our correspondent, Becky Cotterell, is on the site. Becky, what's going on with the bomb? Well, we understand that after a lot of waiting, the bomb is finally on the move from the property where it was discovered on Tuesday to the ferry terminal. We expect that it will be put onto some kind of vessel and taken out to sea where it will be detonated. Now, we'd expected this transportation to happen a little earlier. There has been uh, an evacuation order in place for residents, about 3,000 residents told to evacuate. Uh, that was supposed to be in place between 2 and 5, but we're only now just hearing that the bomb is being moved, so people will have to stay away away from their homes for a little longer, although we understand it only takes about 20 minutes to transport the bomb from the house where it was discovered to the ferry terminal. And there are some people who must live in the houses behind me on the hill, uh, just behind the camera, watching, ready for the moment that we've all been waiting for, which is the detonation of this bomb. We don't know how kind of large or impressive that's going to be, but we understand that the bomb has to be taken out beyond the breakwater, obviously to a safe distance before it can be detonated underneath the water. Now, what do we know about the bomb? Well, as I said, it was discovered on Tuesday. It's thought to weigh around 500 kilograms, uh, and it's a kind of bomb that was used uh, by the German Luftwaffe pilots during the Second World War. There are a lot of these types of bombs that have been discovered in Plymouth because it was targeted during uh, the war. Uh, the people that discovered it, they were doing some work to their garden when they were digging down and hit the bomb, and then obviously called the police, who came out, and apparently it is thought that if this is the safest way to detonate the bomb by taking it out to sea. They had considered doing a controlled explosion at the property, but it's thought it's better um, to, to, put the box into some, to put the bomb into some kind of sealed box so that it can't move, transport it to the ferry terminal, take it out to sea and detonate it underwater. And really now we're just waiting for that moment and hoping it'll be a, a kind of impressive display. Becky, do we have any idea about how far out to sea the uh, bomb is going to be taken before detonation? I'm afraid I don't. I'm, I'm trying to get an answer to that. I'm hoping it's going to be far enough away that I won't get some kind of splashback here or worse. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, and one wonders when uh, people who've asked to evacuate their houses are going to be allowed home. Yeah, I mean, as I say, we only think it's going to take about 20 minutes to get it down to the terminal, but there's always an abundance of caution in cases like this. It's thought that it's most likely this was done in the daytime while people are kind of away and at work and not likely to be at their homes. But as we get to this time, people will want to now be returning and, and get their dinner on. Um, but really, until those cordons are moved, they won't be able to. I mean, it's a fair point because, I mean, it's very, very serious. It's because, I mean, it's in the Keyham district of Plymouth, which is, from my memory, the city, not a million miles away from Devonport Royal Dockyard. Yeah, and it's, it's quite a densely populated area, as you can see. We think that the property um, where the bomb was found was in sort of that, that quite dense um, area of grey roofs there. Oh, you can see some fire engines. I don't know if they're part of the operation. 
Um, so clearly a lot of people impacted by this evacuation order. Really what we're waiting to see is if we're going to see the convoy, the military convoy, taking uh, the bomb down to the ferry terminal for, from our vantage point here. OK, Becky, well, uh, wish you uh, luck with that. We'll uh, obviously await developments with interest. Wish you a peaceful evening down there. Just as well, Plymouth Argyle aren't playing at home tomorrow. I gather there are, the Giles are away at Middlesbrough, so uh, the home park is a good deal uh, of distance from uh, that site where Becky was speaking to us from. That's it from me. I'm back on Monday at half 11. Much more coming up this evening on Sky News with hopefully all the latest from Plymouth. Do have a good weekend. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio. <laughs>